By the 1970s, downtown Bloomington was a shadow of its former self. The south side of the square was in disrepair, and the Graham Hotel, now the Graham Plaza, was abandoned, filled with pigeons and pigeon poop. Only a few restaurants survived in what is now considered the Bead area or district, and in general, what was once a flourishing downtown in the 1940s and 50s, only 20 years later, was struggling to survive. This is that story. Downtown was a lot different then. I think it was kind of just barely holding on, if I'm right. I mean, would that be a fair way to That'd describe it? Absolutely fair way of describing it. Uh, the uh, south side of the square was basically falling apart. I think in the whole like Bead District of Bloomington, you know, 10th Street to 2nd Street, Indiana. I think there may have been 10 restaurants. Sully's, uh, Pagliai's Pizza, Bender's Cafeteria was just a new guy on the block then, and uh, so it's changed a lot. My parents owned the Betty Jean shop. It's in sad, it, it was a sad, sad state of affairs for the, for the square then. Uh, I was obviously younger, not, a, not an architect then. I was uh, my middle school and high school days, but you only went downtown on Friday or Saturday nights to, to drive your car around. You, you know, more shuttered storefronts and, and dirty storefronts where you could write your finger in dust, uh, you know, wash me on the window uh, because it was so empty. But downtown Bloomington wasn't alone in the 1970s. Many towns and cities around the United States were suffering from the same lack of growth closing of businesses and deterioration of their downtowns, many of which never recovered. Just visit some downtowns across Indiana and you'll know what I mean. Anderson, Indiana is a great example. There practically isn't a downtown left at all. Most of the old buildings that made up the business district in the boom years are gone. There are a lot of parking lots and there are a lot of parking garages. What was once a vibrant, booming downtown in the 1920s and 1930s became a ghost town by the 1970s after city planners decided to raise the courthouse and demolish blocks of old businesses and buildings to create parking garages and open lots for new development. But in many cases, the new development never came. Probably the saddest thing is visiting the Madison County Historical Society's website and noticing that almost all the historical buildings they mention are gone. The website never once mentions why they're gone or why you can actually tour the city anymore and see 90% of those historical buildings discussed on the website, like the old courthouse or the opera house. It's almost as if they don't want to talk about it. It probably makes them sick to their stomach. So why did so many downtowns, including our very own, shrivel up almost and die in the 1970s? You don't have to look very far to find the answer. It was a little city planning initiative called Urban Renewal. And it happened everywhere and it's important that we know how it happened and why it happened and what it was because if we don't learn from the past it's always possible we could let it happen again in the future the basic idea behind urban renewal and the whole concept was well-intentioned it was originally conceived in the 1940s for the state to take ownership of whole neighborhoods and declare them as slums using eminent domain after the land was taken, the homes were bulldozed, and in many cases, the poor folks in that neighborhood were moved to modern, low-income city housing, or the projects, as they came to be known. The newly clear land was used to develop new city projects, buildings, or sold to developers to create economic development. The very people urban renewal was supposed to help seemed to lose the most. Poor folks and minorities were hit the hardest, in many cases, by urban renewal. Not only did they lose their homes, albeit those homes and old apartments were probably in very bad shape, they also lost their neighbors and their sense of community, some of which had long proud histories. In Indianapolis, Urban Renewal claimed the Jazz District along Indiana Avenue and many of the neighborhoods around it. Many of those families were moved to newly constructed high-rise projects. Those families may have gained clean running water and a stable roof over their heads, but the connections to their community and the pride they took in their old neighborhood, well, those were taken away from them. But urban renewal advocates and developers didn't stop at demolishing slums and deteriorating neighborhoods. They had their eyes on small towns and cities as well. 
Lest you conclude that we are considering only large cities, let's look at very small ones. Here are some quaint obsolescence in tiny Columbus, Indiana, common, of course, to cities large and small. What started as an effort to provide adequate housing for the poor in the 1940s soon grew into a taste for demolishing anything that was old and needed a little restoration. By the 1950s, organizations like the National Chamber of Commerce openly advocated for the demolition of older homes, even in neighborhoods not hit by blight, and encouraged towns and cities to accommodate the automobile by demolishing older structures and paving lots for parking space. And cities that did this demolishing and paving better than everyone else were given awards, like the All-American City Award, which Bloomington won in the 1950s. While advocates of urban renewal thought the demolition of older structures for economic redevelopment and the mass paving of lots would help downtowns flourish by providing more parking, in actuality, they made them less attractive. Many of the bulldozed homes that were cleared for economic development in the 1950s and 60s were never developed on at all. Instead, they sat dormant for 50 or 60 years. As residential zones along College Avenue, Walnut, Kirkwood, and 4th Street were demolished or changed to commercial zones, there were fewer and fewer options by the 1960s if you wanted to live near downtown. So the small businesses and residents who were forced out of their homes moved to the suburbs, taking their businesses and their business with them. If they reopened their businesses at all, they did so far from downtown. Probably the most devastating part of downtown urban renewal for Bloomington during the 1950s and 60s was the rezoning of old residential neighborhoods into commercial zones, sometimes with little or no rationale at all. Whole historic neighborhoods were bulldozed to make way for commercial zones. With fewer and fewer families living near downtown, there were fewer and fewer local customers. Families who were forced outside of downtown began to shop at those new suburban strip malls and shopping centers. Downtown business by the late 1960s through the 1970s began to suffer from it. A once family-oriented downtown turned to drinking holes, adult movie stores, and theaters. The Harris Grand Theater, which once hosted vaudeville acts and local plays and Hollywood movies, resorted to showing pornography just to keep the doors open. The city council even considered tearing down the courthouse and the south side of the square for newer buildings and parking garages. At one point people were discussing about tearing the courthouse down and when they were going to tear the courthouse down to put a parking garage up because by gosh we needed more parking downtown. I think it brought together a bunch of people in Bloomington who realized that there was an enthusiasm for our downtown because people got together to fight tearing the courthouse down. CFC did Grand Plaza and then CFC did the Fountain Square Mall, which came later. But I think that enthusiasm that came out of saving the courthouse is a big part of where people then started putting money downtown. So where were all these old residential neighborhoods near downtown Bloomington that once sustained local business? Large family homes used to sit along both sides of North College all the way down to 7th Street. Nearly all of them were demolished in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s and rezoned as commercial. Along some parts of College Avenue, commercial development never even happened and the lots just sat empty for nearly 60 years, which in many ways made way for the eventual modern development we have there today. I guess city planners were right about the land eventually being cleared for commercial use, but I'm guessing they didn't think it would take 60 years to happen. And the same thing happened all along North Walnut as well, where we lost one of the most treasured and historical local homes in 1974, when the Morton Hunter Mansion was razed to the ground. In many ways, it was the demolition of the Hunter House that sparked the preservation movement in Bloomington. Residents like Rosemary Miller and the Cook family finally decided to form organizations that would fight rampant and thoughtless demolition. South College is perhaps the greatest example of poor city planning and thoughtless mass demolition of a downtown neighborhood. One of the oldest neighborhoods with some of the grandest of homes once stood along this stretch of South College. After the bulldozers finished their handiwork and raised all the homes along both sides of the streets in the mid-1950s, the newly zoned commercial land sat vacant for 60 years. Now that's what I call a lose-lose situation. The families who were forced to leave their old homes no longer had a neighborhood or neighbors or a community. Local businesses lost 13 to 15 more local families 
who used to frequent downtown businesses and the city of Bloomington got another lifeless sea of pavement that would never be developed into anything at all, ever. All this in the name of progress. Residential homes along East 4th Street were also demolished or converted to commercial zones. Kirkwood Avenue, a massive historic neighborhood with family homes, was totally wiped clean during urban renewal. From 1949 to 1979, 50% of the old residential homes along Kirkwood, from Walnut to Indiana Avenue, were demolished. More were raised after 1975, but by 1982, only a handful of the old homes were still evident along Kirkwood. You have to really pay attention if you want to find them. South Walnut also saw nearly every house or home demolished between 4th Street and 2nd Street during this time period. Thirteen family homes were destroyed here on Block 13 in 1957 to make way for the new post office, a post office that would only stand for 50 years. Once again, the homes were claimed by eminent domain, the families forced to leave and moved elsewhere. Some of the homes demolished included some of the biggest and oldest family homes still standing in Bloomington, including the Orchard Mansion and the Malat family home, both still owned by once prominent local families. Claude Malat was once mayor of Bloomington only 40 years before, but as 91-year-old Clyde Fox, a former resident of Block 13, put it, back then, when the government told you to get out, you didn't fight it. You packed your things and got out. You trusted that they knew what they were doing. This was progress after all. Of course, every arrogant city planning decision was justified with that cliché word at that time, progress. It became an excuse to demolish anything by the 1950s, and they used it often. Of course, the idea was that if the families forced to give up their homes downtown wanted to come back downtown to shop, they could still do that. I mean, we had automobiles now, not horses and buggies. But the truth is, these families moved to the suburbs, and that's where they did their shopping. Downtown businesses began to suffer more. And the local newspapers of the day seemed to be in on the whole urban renewal movement. They celebrated new parking lots in the 1950s and said nary a word about all the old homes that were coming down. While the Bloomington Historic Archiving Team was archiving the Herald Times negatives through the 1950s, I was sure I would find photos by the newspaper documenting all the old homes that were slated for demolition. I was sure that enough people cared about the history of those old homes and, and their old town that they would have documented every historic old structure before it met the wrecking ball. I thought there would be photos. In actuality, our team of archivers found little to nothing, and instead we noted the celebration photos taken of new parking lots, where once a giant 100-year-old Victorian once stood. The vapid focus of the newspaper was on progress and strip malls and new shopping centers. Fifty photos alone were taken of the new Hague's drugstore and its wonderful parking lot along South College, while not a word of mention was given to the whole neighborhood that was uprooted and demolished only a block south. Yes, it seems everyone was drinking the Progress Kool-Aid, even the very people whose job it was to question everything and report on it. It seems everyone was on board with what they called Progress. Little did they know that by the late 1960s and into the 1970s that downtown would begin to suffer the consequences of urban renewal. And progress would probably be the last word a lot of downtown businesses would have used to describe the results of all the demolition and rezoning done so arrogantly and so self-righteously in the 1950s and 60s. The moral of the story is that if you sit back complacently and let city planning happen to you, then don't necessarily expect it's all going to work out as planned. Short-sighted arrogance and unproven self-belief was rampant in city planning during urban renewal. Of a great deal of research and experience has been compressed into this booklet, our Urban Development Guidebook. That's just what it is, by the way, a guidebook for you. There are proven ways to make your city better. Why not have your chamber secure a copy of the Urban Development Guidebook from the National Chamber of Commerce, Washington, D.C.? It was a demolition free-for-all with little consideration of town character, long-term viability, and future tourism. Would future generations want to visit a downtown Bloomington that had become a sea of pavement and parking lots? 
Aerial photos comparing 1949 Bloomington and 1975 Bloomington show the massive parking lotization of downtown Bloomington. Everywhere buildings were demolished and undeveloped land became paved empty lots. This was the future urban renewal progress gave us. And we need to learn from these mistakes. City planning shouldn't be something that happens to a community, but rather something a community needs to be involved with. Today, city planning meetings are public. The plans aren't developed in a void. Everyone can have a voice if they really want to. What happened in Bloomington from 1950 to 1975 was small compared to what happened in other cities that never recovered from the damage of urban renewal. When I hear someone say they miss old Bloomington, I wonder if they mean pre-urban renewal Bloomington because that was old Bloomington and that's been gone for 50 years. When I moved to Bloomington in 1990, it was full of paved lots, empty lots, and deep setback strip malls. Downtown was just getting back on its feet. It's true we've lost more houses and buildings since 1990, but it's a trifle number compared to the thousands of structures that were raised from 1950 to 1975. Today, if you want to demolish an old building, you have to go through hoops, justify your plans, and have a pretty good darn reason to do so. All of the newer and taller buildings everyone complains about were built on lots that have been empty or paved for nearly 50 years. You may not like the taller and newer buildings, and I may not like some of the architectural styles, but I wasn't much of a fan of all the paved lots we had there in the first place. And unlike the 1950s and 1960s when neighborhoods were demolished for commercial development that never even happened, Today, the common citizen has the opportunity to voice their opinion about city planning. If you don't like what you're seeing, I urge you to say something, get involved, or run for public office. No one said anything in the 1950s and 60s, and look what happened. In Bloomington, it wasn't until 1974 or 75 that organizations like Bloomington Restorations Incorporated and Bill and Gail Cook finally stood up and said, Enough! Enough of this! This way of doing things isn't working. The Cooks rescued the south side of the square, restored the broken down Graham Hotel, and revitalized the downtown slowly but surely. This is all while some people were still hooting and hollering about progress and calling for the demolition of the courthouse and the south side of the square. It took years of planning and focus for the downtown to make a comeback. Bill Cook, mm -hmm. uh, famous entrepreneur, medical device uh, inventor, he was very historic-minded, Bloomington-minded, Indiana-minded, Southern Indiana-minded, and he put a lot of money into the restoration of downtown Bloomington. It gave us a set of guidelines that we could uh, not only look at examples of where they succeeded, but it gave us a, a, a kind of, a, it laid out a flow chart on what we could do to uh, get from point A to point B. And, and you know, DBI came out of that. Um, you know, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, you know, my dad was uh, one of the first members of that group and, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Huddleston, who had a uh, Bynum office supply at that time. And their first, one of their first tasks was that they hired a director. Uh, again, following Main Street, and that director was Talisha Kopik, and she's still that director. But it really shows um, the stability that we've had, and that has been another key part, because we've had the stability that a lot of other Main Street organizations have not had, and, and that's been the strength of DBI. Uh, Main Street gave us the guidelines to figure out uh, what we were, what we weren't, what we wanted to be. Main Street gave us a way to find consensus in some form to develop a plan and then that plan became something that we could check and then we finally looked at it and said okay let's open the plan up again it's like a, it was like a time capsule you know um, what did the plan want what did the plan say um, we, we weren't going to hit all of it but we, we hit enough that we saved our downtown from complete despair it's hard to believe today that we managed to save and revitalize our downtown you may not like everything about it, but at least it's not a ghost town. While so many others never recovered from this mass demolition and rezoning, and instead fell into destitution and dilapidation, at least we're not Anderson, Indiana. And at least we're having an open dialogue about what happened then, 
We're not hiding from it. The wrongness of it all, the poor decision making, the short sightedness of progress, and the importance of preservation. That isn't something that's happening in other towns, even today. They're still avoiding the past. I look forward to continuing this dialogue with all of you out there, and thanks for visiting Bloomington then and now, and supporting this project. <laughs>